Okay. All right. So thanks for joining us, everyone. Uh, today's going to be a little bit of a, would you say, a deviation from what we were planning, but I, I think it will be valuable given where we are in the market. All right. So uh, typically at this point in the Foundry programs, we'll give a talk, and we were planning to this time, uh, about fundraising fundamentals for founders, which is a great tongue twister. Um, but yeah, we, we generally go through, look, if you've never raised money before from venture capital, perhaps you're a developer at, at heart, then, then this process is very, very complicated and confusing. And the things that are important in it might not seem important to you from the outside unless you've done it before. Um, and so what we try and do is we try and give some kind of overview uh, of all of the basics that you really absolutely must know before you go about raising capital from uh, VCs for your for your first venture. If you're a you know second or third or fourth time founder, then like okay, you probably don't need to know this, or you probably won't find it so useful. You certainly need to know it, but you'll already have the information. The thing is that this information is normally uh, one of those things that's passed down person to person in the industry and in ecosystem, uh, and it's not written down very much. So either yeah, while we're going to look at something else during today's lecture, which I think is more pressing, uh, I would you know, really, really advise that you go out and you, you find that information either from uh, a previous recording of the lecture that we've done uh, for another session. So you can just find it on YouTube if you search like, are we fundraising fundamentals for founders? Um, or, or you can find it somewhere else. Like there's a textiles book called uh, Venture Deals, which, which is quite valuable as well. Um, but you, one way or another, you've got to find this information if you want to uh, raise capital for your new startup. But uh, given where we are in the market, I think it's it's important that we talk about something else. So it's pretty clear to everyone here, I think that we're in a moment of great opportunity. Um, the world is first yeah, starting to understand what Web3 might be. Uh, the idea of digital scarcity or scarcity of digital assets is becoming essentially close to mainstream at this point. NFTs are making amazing strides uh, towards the mainstream, I would say. And we have, you know, Fortune 500 companies buying large quantities of Bitcoin, uh, which is really incredible to see. Like, I think if if you're like us in the team that, that have been here watching crypto rise for a long time, <laughs> there, there was always this potential that maybe, maybe nothing would come of this, maybe. But that that seems almost impossible at this point. It's very clear that the industry is here to stay and, and will only grow at, at least in the long term from where we are right now. So I would say that the long term fundamentals of crypto are exceptionally strong. However, we have to be realistic about something. So crypto thus far has been a cyclical industry. There have been um, periods of the summer, if you will, uh, where the market's going up, everyone's happy and excited, and periods of winter where everyone's depressed, no one's buying anything, uh, and prices is going down. This is just the nature of, of the um, game as it's existed so far. So this is a great graph that shows that. As you can see, there have essentially been, I think this is arguably the fifth um, yeah, bubble cycle in crypto uh, so far. And, and I'm sure there will be, I'm sure there will be more. And part of the reason for this seems to be that there is an underlying human behavior that is triggered in crowds, which is when large numbers of people at the, around the same time start to realize that there is great opportunity available, um, they, they will sort of flock to it. And, and there's a, would you say, an inherited property from herd behavior around this, which is that basically none of us have time to validate what's good or interesting in the world. We always kind of have to delegate our authority to someone else to, to um, would you say, uh, to find out what is good or what is true and, and so on. Uh, so, for example, you know, we all, well, not necessarily all of us, but many of us trust experts on, on TV about various topics that we are not experts about. We have to delegate some of that uh, processing power about the world to other people. And one of the dangers that can occur in this human behavior, this flocking behavior, if you will, is that something will be discovered as an opportunity and then the, um, the crowd will essentially take it too far, too quickly, uh, following one another, pushing the, the, um, yeah, the mass human behavior in a direction that is actually irrational for the current state of things. 
and and in our industry in the technology industry that's that happens frequently in relation to new technologies and it, it's clear to all of us i think um and if it's not maybe maybe you should like look around at some of the other things happening in the space maybe uh, look at some of the lectures or, or or um yeah look at well really any of the things that are happening in the crypto sphere around web3 and so on it's it, it's very clear that there is something big uh, happening here. There's an opportunity that is enormous. The problem is that we are very, very early in that process. And so um, I would say that there's a danger that the excitement could become unmoored from where we really are in reality. So, and, and that's what appears to happen repeatedly in the crypto space. And I have a theory that, that that's happening more in crypto than in um, other technology industries. So, of course, the, the major uh, previous technology bubble that you could think of would be the dot-com bubble, right? But now there have been like, you know, five essentially in crypto already in basically 10 or 11 years. And one theory for that, I believe, is that uh, the fundamental innovation here is around finance. And so <laughs> that just magnifies the effect. The thing is that Bitcoin is a good store of value if it's storing value and if it's going up in value, then it's even better, or at least, you know, so goes the mind. It's even better of a store of value. And so, of course, I should get in early, you know, blah, blah, blah. And that perpetuates the cycle, which goes up higher and then down further and so on. Um, so it appears that there's some sort of, uh, because the innovation here, the technological innovation has effects on finance, it appears to be magnifying the effects of um, bubble forming behavior in the crowd. So, okay, what I'm about to talk, to talk about is based on our experiences across the, the Arweave team in the 2013-2014 uh, cycle and the 2017-2018 uh, crypto cycles. We, we were there watching um, as, as sort of <laughs> small-time speculators and just kind of having fun uh, looking at the interesting things people were building back in 2013. And um, we were there building a project, building a startup, just like you guys are. Uh, in 2017, 2018. So we've seen this a couple of times um, firsthand, and then we've also spoken to lots of other people about their experiences. And I'll be trying to weave those experiences in uh, throughout the rest of the throughout the rest of the talk. All right. So where are we today? Who remembers what was it? Two weeks ago, three weeks ago, when Yang Cat selling for six hundred thousand was a big deal. Yeah, that was <laughs> pretty crazy. We thought, and then Beeple. <laughs> Well, two weeks later, 100 times the price, $65 million. It's, it's a very interesting collage, but um, that's an awfully large jump for a very short period of time. Um, and it's not really clear that there's the, would you say, that the NFT space is mature enough to support something like this yet, to support the uh, consistent valuation of that um, asset at this point. That hasn't been proved. And certainly wasn't proved that, that was true at the $600,000 level. Um, now at the $65 million level, that, that question is only, you know, a hundredfold more pressing. Now, I think that there's very reasonable arguments to be made that long-term NFTs can hold value. Um, just, you know, for, well, I'm sure you've heard all these arguments before, but that's not really the point. The point is right now is the world in a space where we can support $65 million of value in this one image that you're looking at right now. Which, for what it's worth, of course, I copied and pasted into this um, <laughs> into this deck. I paid no one. I don't even know who the author is, and I wasn't breaking any copyright laws doing so. Which is an interesting component. Okay, now price of Bitcoin. Well, that looks pretty exponential, doesn't it? Um, and <laughs> those of us that were around for the 2017-2018 uh, cycle, remember when that little peak down there in, in the middle of the uh, chart was enormous, when that was dwarfing everything, when it looked absolutely absurd. Um, yeah, here we are again. Uh, now that looks tiny by comparison. And, and when you look down here on the bottom left, you can see that the 2013-2014 cycle, which trust me, the graphs felt and looked the same just then, is absolutely minuscule now by comparison. So I would say, and this is just a personal opinion, but I would say that the likelihood that we are now somewhere in the midst of a crypto bubble cycle is about 
something like that. I, I could be wrong. I'm not a trader. Um, and what would you say? I'm not a trader. And uh, I would also say naturally my inclination is more bearish than the market. This appears to be the case. So this is my personal bias. Um, but whether or not we are in a crypto bubble right now, the likelihood is there will be bubbles in the future. So this is valuable information to have nonetheless. Uh, an interesting thing to look at is the rest of the market too. Like this is the NASDAQ. Mm, interesting. Look at 2000, look at 2021. It's kind of reminiscent. Um, is it possible that we're in a bubble inside a bubble? Uh, and, and the best analogy for that actually comes from the formation of rogue waves. So you see this sort of when two bubbles stack on top of each other, the, the peaks and then the troughs are even more intense. Um, I'm, I have less confidence about this, much less confidence. I would say maybe 30 or 40 percent. But we can go through some you know, interesting quotes from uh, founders in the ecosystem I've been speaking to recently. Uh, these are not verbatim quotes. I've, I've essentially just paraphrased what they were talking about across a long conversation into just you know, a few lines of text. But this is a faithful representation of, of what they were saying. So I had lined, uh, yeah, I had lined up investors my first round. Um, this was someone from our ecosystem, the PermaWeb. Uh, but when I went back to them after two weeks, they told me that they deployed the entire fund. So they had no more capital, despite the fact that they promised this founder some capital. Uh, they said they would reach out to me when they had more capital to spend. Um, this founder actually relayed that this same pattern had happened to him twice, uh, twice in just you know, a few weeks. Pretty interesting. Okay, this is from tech, not, not from crypto, but I think it's worth thinking about. This is from a founder who is raising at a $220 million valuation, has less than 100 users. And their product is, you know, the kind of mass consumer product that you need lots of people to use in order to make sense. This is not like Palantir where they have like, yeah, a few dozen customers is a big deal. No, this is the kind of thing where per seat you're going to charge you know, uh, tens of dollars. So so a hundred dollars is really not many. And I believe that their product is in a free stage right now. Uh, and they're raising a quarter of a billion dollar valuation. It's quite something. And it appears to be representative of the entire startup market right now. So what happens next? This is this is just based on experience and with the assumption that this is a bubble. Perhaps it isn't, but we believe that it probably is. Likely three to nine months more growth will happen from this point. By precedent, this, this is not the peak of the cycle. So you can look at this uh, just on the graphs, right? Um, the 2017, 2018 cycle, you know, you get the starting price in the, in the trough between the last peak and the, the next one of $230. Then it peaked about 20,000. Then it went down to, to 3,500. Um, and then, of course, where we are today, you see that we started, you know, somewhere around 3,500, and then we, we're up to 60K now. So some more room to grow, probably. Um, that would be my expectation, but again, could be wrong. During this period, funding will be extremely easy, um, at least relatively. And I think that, that that plays out in the experiences of the founders we're, we're speaking to in the ecosystem right now. Uh, funding is certainly much more available than it was just six months ago, which is great to see. Like, there's a lot of really amazing projects out there, but we need to be careful about how this is done. Funding is not all funding is the same, and I'll get into uh, how we can how we can approach and think about that in just a little while. Um, newbies will be drawn into the possibility of the space, which is great. More people learning about what crypto is and how it works is always good. Um, but they will also be uh, encouraged to join in uh, by the money being made in the space. And this this is where things get a little bit gnarly, I would say, uh, because as the bubble cycle goes on, the more CNBC headlines we'll see of, you know, Bitcoin doubles in price in two weeks, uh, Ethereum, new altcoin doubles in, you know, whatever it is, doubles in price in three days. Uh, and, and people with shorter and shorter time horizons will be brought into the space, hoping to get rich quickly. In reality, hoping to get rich quickly almost never works. Um, and, and this is the, would you say, one of the starting points of the danger. 
So ideas will be rapid and fleeting. The, the whole industry will move from one sort of craze and obsession to another in just uh, a decreasing time span you'll see. Um, I would say that we, we saw some perhaps beginning phases of the, uh, of the current cycle with DeFi over the summer. Now, some ideas in DeFi are great, really, really smart, really interesting. Um, there's a lot of fantastic work being done there. However, there is also pasta coin. Uh, and, um, well, who knows, all the other food coins too, where people were very clearly just sort of, to be blunt about it, they were, they were printing a shit coin and then they were pumping the value of that token um, via people, you know, shilling it to one another, essentially on Twitter, largely, um, it, to make it so that there was a two-sided market. So everyone knew that they could get the token for free by basically staking on this contract, and then the token would be minted and given to them. Um, but there were a bunch of people, apparently enough people, that couldn't really be bothered to do that. And so we just go and buy the token. And so now you've created a market where the token is being created uh, by people depositing tokens, and so gaining an incentive to go and spread the word, and then people coming along and buying the tokens. And this sort of basic mechanism design led to this sort of bizarre herd behavior where we would see, you know, the assets under management of a, um, or the locked assets for a smart contract um, move from zero to you know, 250, 300, maybe if I recall correctly, 550 or 700 in, in just 48 hours. It's a, uh, it was a cycle that I think in retrospect, we can see that there was nothing about this that was really related to the fundamentals. This was just a sort of herd behavior, which at least in an improvement on the 27 era, I would say, was what people were describing as a massive money game. So a lot of this was simple gambling and everyone knew it was gambling. And, and that to some extent is at least more um, honest and fair than the 2017 uh, craze of the time, which was, you know, these ICOs, which made no sense um, with, by founders that essentially just ran off with the money uh, and the token prices dumped 99% or more often than just running off with the money, they would, they would pivot to do something else and then leave the token, you know, unrelated to the project, uh, which happened in just numerous, numerous cases uh, and left a lot of people burnt. So we can see even now that some of these, some of these behaviors are increasingly nonsensical. Um, I would even say in the NFT space, you're not seeing a lot of the, the same, um, <laughs> what the, uh, the so-called DGEN crowd would call pumponomics um, factors coming about. I, I was looking a little bit carefully at a, an NFT project a few days ago that was talking about how essentially what they were planning to do was there were going to be I, I wanted to put in the deck here, uh, yeah, a an excerpt of how their their structure worked, how their mechanism design basically worked. But unfortunately, um, I couldn't do so without revealing the name. But essentially, the structure is like this: they create what is it, like ten thousand of these things. Uh, they put aside, you know, twenty to thirty percent of that, who they which they plan to give to crypto influencers in. Re um, in exchange for those influencers, basically like pumping the price of the others. So telling people about how great this NFT project is and why they should go buy them. Um, and all sorts of other behavior like that, which leads to short term price rises, which leads us to the rate of scams will increase. Now, to be frank, it's, it's not clear really what a scam looks like in the NFT space. Like in the ICO space, it was very clear. The team would come along and promise to do something uh, that they wouldn't then deliver on, like promise to build a whole product and then they would just not do it. Um, that very clearly a scam. However, in the NFT space, what is a scam? Uh, and the same with uh, DeFi pumponomics projects, you know, the, the food coins of the world. Um, what precisely is a scam here? It's not clear yet, but but what is clear is that, you know, the, um, the dissociate, yeah, dissociation from core underlying value to sort of rampant speculation will become greater. Um, or it is becoming greater and will continue, I believe. So at some point in this process, the direction will change. Uh, the, the 
hysteria and excitement will be uh, exhausted and people will start to doubt the underlying fundamentals of, you know, this week it's a $65 million NFT. Um, next week, who knows what it'll be. But one day we will reach a moment where this direction will change. Then it'll look like this, right? So this is from the 2017, 2018 cycle. You saw that uh, if you were there in November, yeah, in December 2018, you remember this was a pretty painful moment. I remember we were um, co-working one day in, in a place where uh, some consensus and Ethereum people were hanging out and, and Ethereum had just dropped from, if I remember correctly, $1,500. Now it was double digits again for the first time and the, the mood was pretty rough. Like this is not, <laughs> this doesn't feel good for anyone. Um, I think it was at $78 that day. And then sure enough, basically exactly the same uh, graph just from the cycle before that. So this is very predictable process in some way. The herd moving in on the trust that they're giving to other members of the herd, this sort of um, deference of, of authority or, or actually research typically, um, yeah, reaches a point where people suddenly start to say, wait, what is it that I'm buying? Why is this? Why does this make sense? And they see that actually it's overvalued. And the problem then becomes that they overcorrect the other way too. We, we heard in and then we heard out of things. And this is just the natural process of human crowd behavior, unfortunately. And then the key thing is the large numbers of retail and institutional investors will at least temporarily lose capital. It is the inevitable outcome of these cycles. Uh, for what it's worth, also some people uh, will gain capital when they, when they quit at the top. Um, that's very hard to predict and human behavior typically actually leads us to hold on to things longer. Uh, reactions will start with denial, then panic, and then the death threats. And this is very, very serious. In fact, not just death threats, but so for example, you note the timestamp on this BBC News post is November 9th, 2018. Man sent letter bomb to Bitcoin firm of a password reset. So he thinks that he's lost his, his tokens. And obviously you guys know that, you know, the people that make a wallet, they can't, they can't reset your password. That's not the way that the system works. And this person presumably brought, bought into Bitcoin on a, uh, using a wallet, a non-custodial wallet where they were supposed to be the custodian. And now they find that they didn't know what they were doing and they've lost money and they're very upset about it. So upset that they're sending a letter bomb, which is really quite something. It's very, very serious and very real. Uh, this, the outcome of the, the behaviors that happen in this. And, and it only gets worse. I remember this from the 2013, 2014 cycle. Uh, it's really quite remarkable when you see the, the national suicide hotline uh, information trending as the, the number one thing on our cryptocurrency. I think that's a real, um, you say, kick in the teeth, something like that. It's very, very sad to see. The effects of these herd behaviors are extremely um, detrimental and dangerous. But, of course, there, there is opportunity here, and we'll get to how to try and navigate the, the deep complexities of the situation in just a moment. But another thing that you'll find is there'll be many, many, many people that will burn out. Um, I think during the last cycle where, where I was really working with other founders in the space a lot, I, I saw at least three burnouts from the people around me, um, and, I, and I heard of many others. I heard of people having mental breakdowns and, and having to be you know, checked into psychiatric wards because of the uh, stress that they were they were receiving from actually uh, retail investors in telegram channels and this kind of thing. Really, really awful stuff. And no doubt in, in our own team, I know that the uh, we fortunately had nothing like this, but in our own team, I, I know that the stress that was uh, yeah placed on on some of the people that had to manage the support channels was just so enormous because of the pressure and the, um, the, the feelings of unhappiness from, from the speculators that had been taking part in this, that yeah, it was just absolutely awful. Very, very, very uh, difficult for everyone involved. It's not a good thing. 
Let me just check that this isn't someone saying yes. Good. Last time we gave a talk, um, it cut out halfway through, so I have a phone so people can tell me if that happens again. Um, yeah, this was a founder that, that I was pretty close to. And when I first started working with them, uh, I truly believed that they were unstoppable. I don't think I'd ever seen anyone work like this person. Uh, in some extent, I still believe they are just profoundly, uh, well, what's the word? It, just an extraordinary operator, just able to operate a level that almost everyone cannot. And I, I only wish that I could operate at that level. But, you know, after I think I received these messages from this person, um, yeah, around December 2018, saying, I feel like I'm on acid all the time. They had to take a long break after this. Um, and it, yeah, it's very, very sad to see. So human side effects considered, you've got to also understand that early stage deals will be nearly impossible. And, and this is a danger because it's very clear that there's so much amazing stuff that can be built in this space. There's so much um, uncharted territory that we can explore and should be exploring because there is value to be created over the long term. And, and you are all founders here able to, to take hold of that opportunity and, and turn it into something both amazing for the world and, and for you and, and your investors, for everyone. Like there is real opportunity here, but the problem is going to be that nobody will be able to raise any money during this period, full stop. Um, you know, in the worst nine months of it, particularly. Um, it, in the case of Arweave, there was a period of about six months after the network launched in June 2018, where just almost nobody was buying any tokens. And I don't mean, yeah, I don't mean like, yeah, there was a small amount of liquidity. I mean, no. <laughs> you literally could not find a single person to buy any tokens. During this period, um, there was very little liquidity for Arweave. We hoped to be listed on uh, Bittrex, who eventually did list us, but unfortunately they took two years to do that. Um, literally two years from when we signed the listing agreement. But during this period, okay, there, there was great demand for selling tokens. And this, this is a danger that we'll talk about in a moment. Um, it's great demand for selling tokens. So, so we worked with another partner to set up an OTC desk where people could sell their tokens if they wanted to. Uh, and, and when we set it up, absolutely no one wanted to buy. There was simply zero demand. And so the, the, the desk stayed stagnant. And then ironically, about a year later, the desk eventually closed because there was no one that wanted to sell. So they couldn't match any orders. But for a period that there was absolutely nothing flowing. And so if you are an early stage founder and you're trying to pursue one of the amazing opportunities in this space, you've got to understand that once this is all over, you, there will be a period where you just won't be able to raise any capital if you need it. And it will cause your uh, project to fail if you cannot bridge the gap. So somewhere after the 12 month mark, the market will start to normalize and, and get back to something that's um, uh, sane, essentially, I would say. Okay. All of this aside, and maybe I'm wrong, but we've seen this cycle a lot. It's, it's possible. I, and for what it's worth, I think the one thing that's worth considering um, that might be a reason that this doesn't end the way that all the other cycles ended, uh, you know, number five, this is essentially, uh, the reason number five might not end in the same way as all the rest is perhaps because there's just so much institutional money now in the space that won't sell, um, then actually the there will likely be a shock to, to the downside, uh, but it arguably might not be so so deep and so uh, serious. I think that's definitely a possibility. I think most likely what's going to happen over a long period of time is that the, the peaks and the troughs of the bubble get sort of the, the band, if you will, between them gets narrower and narrower. Um, that's likely the way that it will trend, and we might well be on that path towards that this time. So it might not be as bad as the last one, uh, but we should prepare. We should think seriously about it and then hope for the best you know prepare for the worst hope for the best as they say all right so what to do well first make sure you can survive and make sure you act fairly to to everyone that's involved in your project uh, and and focus on thriving in the long term not the short term you know the the market won't stay like this and cannot um cannot continue in an exponential pace forever uh, at this exponential pace at least it just simply won't happen. So you've got to think like, hey, okay, 
when this is all over, what am I going to do? How does my adoption process look? Where do I want to be in three or four years time? When the cycle comes around again, and again, probably in a decreasingly intense form, where do I want to be? So survive. It's very obvious you need to have capital to bridge the winter. If you don't, then you will likely fail. You'll need to find something to do now to make that work. Uh, are we very nearly fell in this trap for what it's worth? Uh, we were one of the last major projects to, well, we weren't major at the time, or major even now, but <laughs> we were one of the last projects to raise a serious round of any kind in the 2018 cycle. We could have all disappeared. And for sure, if we if we hadn't raised that capital, then uh, we wouldn't be here today. And and the token price, you know, which, well, we'll get to that in a second, but uh, yeah, it wouldn't be where it is either. And worse outcomes would have had to would have been had for all of the stakeholders in the project. So when you reach the winter, the one thing, in, so if you've got capital, that's great. You get to the winter, the clear, clear and obvious thing to do is use it to build and gain users. What's a little bizarre is, is during the last cycle, my confidence in cryptocurrency as an industry grew enormously. Um, when I saw that the prices were, were dumping and they were just like an awful, awful quantities, 10% per day was like nothing. Forget it, it's nothing. Uh, you know, 40% days were, were big. But money was, and value was being lost everywhere. Yet the people I was speaking to on a day-to-day -day basis were just as committed, just as happy and focused on building this thing on the, over the long term. And those are the people that have succeeded. The people that, that were worried by the, um, by the downturn and, and lost focus, those are the people that aren't around today. So just use the winter to gain uh, usage and build your application into something great. At fairly, this is this is critical, absolutely critical, because as we can see, the the potential downsides of this cycle that we're going through are just awful. The the human cost of these things is is real, very very serious. So I think the core thing to do is to gain a reasonable valuation and then state your realistic plans to the people backing your project and execute on them. There's nothing more or less you can do than this. And I would say in regards to the reasonable valuation, you should be thinking something like the two year moving average price for your project. That's what you get in the equities market, the traditional startup market. Uh, you'll get some sort of average, which is not so enormously affected by the current prices of the tokens. And you've got to think that like, you want to thrive, you want this thing to be uh, successful over a long period of time. And it's, yeah, it's, it's much, much more uh, valuable to you and to everyone if you play the game that way, if you try and make the thing successful over a long period rather than a short period. Uh, we see in a, each cycle, sometimes there are founders that, that go about trying to basically hype the price of the token over a short period. Uh, and those, those projects, um, at least all the ones I'm aware of that were, that were doing that, and we were actually, um, yeah, we, we were watching this pretty closely. They, they're essentially all gone now. You, you won't find any trace of them because they burn themselves out, not, not just personally, but they, they burn out the coffers of the project, for example. Uh, and there's a ton of different ways that they try and do this. And one is through the sort of hype marketing, another is through uh, using, you know, uh, tactics to, to purchase tokens from the market strategically to make the price go up and all sorts of dubious um, dubious strategies in that sense. But look, from the founder's perspective, it's better if you try and thrive long term. And the sensible thing to do there is to sort of get the average price for the cycle that you're going into. That would be the same thing to do here. And then uh, these partners you're bringing on that you'll have to work with for years and years Everyone will be reasonably comfortable with what happened during that period. Um, and there's a flip side to this too, which is, so it's just as unreasonable for um, VCs to, to buy into projects at the depth of the market where the, uh, where the valuations are completely, completely against the founder's favor. Like things are far, far undervalued as it is for founders to go out and raise capital when the markets are too high. This is the opposite side of the same coin. Um, and so it's up to you to some extent to work out what you're comfortable with as a, um, yeah, ethically and, and with a focus on the long-term relationships you're trying to build with your backers as to, to what prices you pick. Um, for what it's worth, I, 
I only know of a handful of investors that would be willing to give you a good, sensible valuation that might even be above market, short-term market rate in the, in the pit of the bear market. But those are also the best investors you should be hoping to work with. So, um, yeah, it's up to you to decide where you, where you draw that line. Uh, there's definitely arguments to be made on all sides of it, but you should just be careful of thinking about the long term. You've got to build these relationships uh, and make sure that they, they last and work over a long period of time. And no one's going to be happy if, if they feel that they were unjustly uh, charged, essentially, by you during the, the, the uh, bubble, uh, the peak of the bubble in the market. That won't be good for anyone. So you must raise now. Like right now, there, there is no alternative. If you don't have enough capital in the bank to make it through to the other side of the winter and best case scenario, we're talking nine months until you can raise it all. Mid case, we're talking 12 months. Worst case, we're talking 24 months. If you don't have capital in the bank to pay salaries for your team while you're building this thing, while you're gaining adoption and traction for that period of time, you need to raise capital now while you can. You need to optimize for fairness in the deals that you're making, focusing on thriving in the long term, not the short term. Uh, the projects that raise like excessively high quantities during the like really excessive into the hundreds of millions um, during the last market, they have not actually done very well. Um, they they might control reasonably high prices in the market still. Some of them, a lot of them have just disappeared completely, but some of them still control reasonably high prices but they don't have adoption. And part of the reason for that is everyone knows them as a sort of, um, well, they know what happened. The whole thing became around fundraising and maximizing for short-term profit. Uh, and no one feels that that's fair. And, and it really harms the, the process. Or it really harms what they're trying to do long-term. So I think if you optimize for fair, fairness and thriving in the long-term, better things will come to you over time. You'll be seen as a reasonable person doing business in a reasonable way, even though the reality of the industry we find ourselves in is that we we just have these bubbles and and you can't uh, you can't do the opposite you can't wait for the bear markets to raise because you won't be able to or you'll give away excessively high quantities of your of your project at too low a valuation so that that doesn't work either you just need to be reasonable in the middle and over a long enough period of time I think people recognize that and and it, and it will work out better for you. Okay, here's a controversial opinion. Do not encourage retail capital to take part in your project. If you encourage retail capital to take part, uh, and, and we were certainly, would you say, in, in the 2017, 2018 cycle, we saw that the democratization of access to what are essentially, um, you know, startup enterprises. It was really, really cool. It's great that people can go out and get access to this stuff early. Um, the, the problem is, that when the market falls, no matter what you do to try and, um, what would you say, align people with the long-term prospects of the, the project, no matter what you do, people will sell and they will lose money. So it, are we prices as an example? Back in 2018, the highest price that we sold tokens at was 77 cents. And by December that year, the, the prices were down to 10 cents, which is, you know, just enormous drop. Uh, and by March of this year, the price is now 140 fold. So if you'd held at the beginning, you'd make essentially 20 fold uh, on, your, on your investment in just under three years, 20 fold. And if you bought at the, the, the trough, and for what it's worth, the way that we played this as the Arweave project is like we, we saw this, you know, we raised at what was a reasonable valuation relative to the rest of the market, actually a lot lower than the rest of the market. Um, and still the prices drop because the prices drop uniformly everywhere. Uh, and we, we figured that the best way to play this was just to like stay focused on the long term of the mission. Don't really change anything about the way we're acting. Kind of ignore the prices, if you will, and focus as best we could, at least. Um, but that didn't, that didn't uh, what would you say, shield us from the, the downward trend of the, the token price. It did, however, mean that we recovered. And, some, some projects, they, they start to do really crazy things when the prices go down. They really pump money into marketing to try and, and, and short-term marketing, essentially hype, to, to try and reverse the trend, uh, which is a, a losing battle. Uh, but, you know, if you stay focused on the, the long-term 
fundamental value of the thing you're building, then generally better things happen. But the fact is, we, we couldn't stop the people that backed us in June selling tokens in December. And I don't believe that you will be able to either this time around. Um, it's just herd psychology. And it, yeah, I don't know that there's very much you can do about it. So, so I would avoid that because not only does it protect them, it protects you too. Uh, unhappy people about falling token prices or you know, people that are unhappy about falling token prices will find ways to take it out on the team. As we saw uh, before, um, the you know people sending bombs to to the offices of, of uh, yeah people building crypto wallets is it's not cool behavior to be on the receiving end of. And we could go into the, this in more detail, um, but there are just numerous ways that that. This can not just distract you from the mission of building the thing that you're trying to build, but also just make it kind of intolerable uh, as an environment to work in. It should make it much harder for you and your team to focus on the stuff that is important. So I would argue that, that what you really need to do, number one, is enforce token lockouts. So you should be thinking, hey, is it possible for me to lock the tokens that people purchase until such a time that I think that we're going to be on the other side of the winter? Right, so the, the worst of the token price falls in the rest of the market will be over and will be back to some form of normalization before people can sell the tokens again, because that will at least stop them selling during the pit of the market. That's one way to go about this. Helps somewhat. Uh, I think that you know lockups in 12 month lockups at this point uh, might help a little bit with that, but you'll probably end up just on the other side of the fall in the market, maybe even a little bit while, while still, things are still going down, but certainly not in a recovery and ramp up again phase. 24 months ideally would be good. That should put you in a really strong position. And if there's a lot of demand and excitement for your round, pick the partners that you work with well, it's something we're going to talk about, um, but then enforce like three year lockup, a four year lockup. So that essentially it's right back into the next cycle, most likely that the tokens actually become unlocked because that will allow you to focus. And then they're essentially taking a venture bet just like they would in normal VC in tech. But they're saying, okay, uh, I think the, the team is great. The idea that they're following is great. Let's put some money into it. And four years from now, we'll see what comes out. Maybe it'll be amazing. It'll be, you know, like a hundred X or a thousand X. Um, and maybe it'll go to zero. And, but this is the normal VC game. And, and that I think is a, a reasonable thing to shoot for in this environment where, where things are frankly made much more complex by the, uh, by the cyclical nature of it. So another important thing, like perhaps the most important factor actually, is to pick investors to work with that you think will weather the storm well. This you will care about so much uh, uh, nine months from now where prices are dropping. Do you think this person is, um, is able to deal with that fact that prices are dropping in the short term? Or, or are they going to be very, very worried and start taking all of your time? Um, yeah, and and make it harder for you to operate. Will they back you or, or will they make it harder? And I would I would say from the experiences that you know projects had in the 2017 cycle, if you if you take retail capital, and it's really unfortunate, but you know, the, the arguments for democratization of access to investment are strong. It's it's cool that we can allow people, just any person, to put ten dollars into some cool new startup and, and if it succeeds, they can they can gain a lot of capital out of the end of it. Um for having been smart and it feels reasonable that people should be able to take part in that. Um, you know, particularly if they can, for example, go gambling. If gambling is legal, then why on earth is startup investment not legal for uh, for people or accessible? That's, that's definitely the argument on that side. But realistically, I think if you ask any founder that went through the 2017, 2018 cycle uh, that, that had any sort of association with retail capital, um, they'll tell you that when things got bad, uh, the, uh, the distraction caused by those investors was just absolutely catastrophically bad. Uh, it made it almost impossible for them to operate. You've got to think like, you know, when you have uh, 
when you have people in, in such a state of mind that they're willing to do things like send bombs to people's offices, imagine the kind of things that they will say to the team members that have to do customer support. And imagine what kind of working environment that creates while you're trying to do the already very difficult job of starting a startup. Yeah, that's um, it's no small thing. Very dangerous. So pick your investors well. Uh, one way to do that is to ask for founder references, right? To ask the VC that, that wants to take part in your round, hey, uh, please can I speak to five other founders that you've backed before? I'd really love to know, you know, what it's like so that we can work together. You got to think of it, and I talk about this more in the uh, the normal version, if you will, <laughs> the <laughs> normal times version of this talk uh, about fundraising fundamentals. It, you've got to think of it like the VCs that you're picking are essentially business development partners that you simply cannot fire. Uh, like it's a very um, it's a very important decision to be made uh, to make in normal times, but. But in these times, it's even more important. You're going to have to work with these people one way or another. So you need to make sure that you pick correctly. And, and the best way to do that is ask other founders what it's been like to work with them so far. And then the people that they refer you to, that's great. But you should also see if through your network uh, and, and if you need help, please reach out to us. We're more than happy to do this. Uh, you can reach out to other founders that they list on their portfolio page of their fund. Right. So, so you can see all the people that they, they hold you know, uh, stakes in the success of. I just find some more at random and say, hey, can I can I find a way to speak to the founder of this project? And we'll help you there if you need to. Um, but you also might be able to do it yourself or you can ask other founders that you know, that might know them and so on. You can find your way to them one way or another. Uh, do that so that you know what it's like to work with them uh, from people that they haven't necessarily picked out. This is an important step. And then you can get like a really robust understanding. And the best you can hope for, I'd say, is, and this came from a founder who was um, just encountering uh, issues, or regulatory issues, essentially, uh, in a very public and very, very, very bad way uh, during the, the fall of 2018 cycle. Uh, they gave a reference for me for a uh, group that, that we ended up working with and were very, very happy working with, um, where, you know, when times were bad, uh, they were there for me. We got on the phone that afternoon. They were there, they were attentive, and they were supportive uh, of the project when, when things uh, yeah, when things went wrong, essentially, when they were trying to work their way through the difficult thing that is starting a, uh, a project like this in a space where you know, the playbook is not known. So um, this is the best thing you can hope for, uh, and, and I think you should shoot for that. Listen carefully to what the founders say, ask honest questions, um, uh, ask about the things you really want to know about. There, there is no, I've seen enough of these conversations now to know that there's nothing that's really off limits. Everybody has the same concerns, even if they're not necessarily polite, frankly. Um, you should just be blunt, be clear, get the real feedback that you need before you start working with people, particularly in this environment. So another thing I would say is to keep the circle small. You don't want to take a really large number of investors at a time like this. You want to make sure that the investors you're working with uh, you allow in a, a very sensible, reasonable uh, valuation so that no one feels burnt. Uh, and the, the circle of people that you're working with is, uh, is what would you say, it's few enough that you can uh, maintain really strong relationships with them. And so they can be comfortable with you and you can be comfortable with them. Uh, because this is going to be uh, sort of a, a rocky ride you're going to have to go through one way or another. Um, and the, one of the dangers that founders sometimes encounter is if they take on large numbers of VCs. And, and there's, there's an argument to be made for this, which is something along the lines of, well, one of the things VCs can offer is not just capital, but also help in certain ways. Uh, again, this is like the business development partner you can't fire argument. Um, but they can offer help, and, and if it's the right fit, then it can be great. Um, that's really valuable. But the problem is when you have too many and, and when things are uh, very uncertain in the market, so prices are dropping, People are uncertain about the future. The, the amount of time commitment from the founder's point of view that will be required to maintain those relationships is going to increase. So if you have too many people, you're going to fall into the potential trap uh, of simply not being able to keep up with the amount of inbound you're getting, uh, let alone do that and also make your project successful. And if you stop being able to uh, keep up with the amount of inbound you're getting, um, then you, yeah, you run the risk of sort of like, fear cascade in the market, essentially, you know, 
they, they say they gave you money and, and now they can't get hold of you. And then they talk to their friends, you talk to their friends and there's friends in the circles and, and there's fear growing and growing. And now you have even more people coming to talk to you. This is, this is bad. Keep the circle small, make sure everything is reasonable and fair the entire way along and, and you will do better. Okay, last point, prepare mentally. This is not gonna be an easy ride. Everything looks very exciting right now. And it, that's because it is exciting. There is a huge amount of opportunity available here for people to follow and for you to pick up the mantle and build uh, the, the services that will replace Google and will replace Facebook and will replace Twitter. They will all be born out of this process, I believe. Um, however, you've got to understand that the, 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 the upside of the market swing right now will have almost certainly uh, a correlated downside and that will be difficult. You, you should understand that and you should start to prepare yourself for what will be required from you as the founder of a project doing that. All right. So, <laughs> um, I, I hope that wasn't too much of a downer. Uh, I really think that there, there's amazing opportunities available, both uh, for the people, yeah, essentially, just like we've been saying, you, you should be, if you are in the right position, you have a great idea, you're a great founder, you should be quitting your job and you should be starting a project. You should be raising capital on reasonable terms now. And you should be then building this thing for two or three years and eventually you're gonna replace Twitter, Facebook, Google. These things will happen. It seems so clear. The opportunity is so obviously available, but you also got to understand that the, um, the situation we're in right now is, is not just a rosy party. This is very serious and, and we'll have uh, complex moments that will test you. All right. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Um, yeah, we're going to go to, let me see. Can I stop sharing my screen? It's really helpful. Um, actually, I'm not sure I can close my, can we, there we go. Ah, okay. So yeah, we're going to go to gather town now and we'll have a, um, yeah, we'll have a conversation about this. I'm really interested to hear everyone's thoughts and feedback. Um, yeah, uh, we're always here for what it's worth to support you. If you're in the, um, in the incubator, or the, the, the program we're running and frankly, anyone else, we're always happy to talk and offer some advice. And, and if you guys think I'm wrong completely, uh, then that's great too. Please tell me about it. I, I really want to know. I'm not claiming to have all the answers here, just, just noting some patterns we've seen before and what's likely to happen uh, given those patterns. All right. See you in Gather Town, everyone. Bye.